what does education mean to you? Education to me is more than just memorizing facts. It's about developing the ability to think for oneself and navigate the complexities of life. It's about acquiring knowledge that leads to a purposeful and fulfilled life by using that knowledge to solve some of the problems in the society. However, our conventional education system often falls short of these ideals. We can sit down, develop what is actually fit and suitable to for us. our own continent. Mm -hmm. We know our own challenges, we know our problems, we know our resources, we know. So instead of blindly following a standardized education model, each society, people or nation need to first sit together and collectively define what education means for them and then work towards achieving that, just like this man did. The vision dated back to almost about 20 years ago. Because of my own background, I came from the village, you know, and um, there were so many things that we lacked. But um, by the sheer grace of God, I had the opportunity to be able to read quite a number of books. That was opening my mind to quite a number of things. It was in some of those books that there and then that I knew there could be an alternative way to actually educate our children. And that was the beginning of the idea of homeschooling the children rather than taking them to the conventional schools. We did not originally plan to set up any school at all. It is just my own children that I was educating at home. And some friends along the line saw that, wow, this is a fantastic thing. They are seeing about the outcomes they could see with my children and co. And one after the other, they started bringing their kids here and there for me to also you know, extend whatever that I was doing with my children to them. And this is what eventually metamorphosed into what we have as a school today. This is Lokman Molumo. He founded Heritage Global Academy, a disruptive learning environment that challenges the status quo of conventional education. This is a home school where these kids who come from different countries and different states of Nigeria live and learn. They are taught everything from Quran to Islamic studies, entrepreneurship to leadership, robotics to programming, and even games. Chess is mandatory for these kids. Mr. Lokman believes that the current curriculum fails to address the unique needs and challenges of our society. So since he cannot change the curriculum because it's run by the state, he took matters into his own hands, starting with his own children. There were five key knowledge areas that I was looking for that would make a total child education. So that, those five key areas are one, secular education. That's number one. Number two is because we are Muslims, that our children also need, we need to be very deliberate and very intentional about how to educate them with the you know, faith-based education, knowing the pristine Islam. So we need to do that. So that was the second leg of learning for me. The third leg is that these children, even though they could have been born in Nigeria, they are global citizens. So what makes them global is what is upstairs, not about the location that they were born in. These children, if we have to make them successful in the world, then they will have to also be globalized in terms of their learning, in terms of their knowledge, so that our children will be competitive at a global level. Then the fourth one, we, I love to call it with our local language to say that it is Omoluabi, which is translated into a value-based education, moral-based education, that irrespective of whatever these children must have learned, they had the best of uh, quality education, they had the best of Islamic education, they are globalized in their thinking, in their approach, and what have you. They must also, you know, um, um, go along with very good moral, good character, good personalities, and, co and we have to be very intentional about teaching them all of this. And the fifth one is that there is no education as far as I'm concerned in 21st century without technology. So we must not just be saying about technology, technology, and making our children to be technology users. No, we, they must be creators of technology. 
what does it take us to start grooming our children from the younger age, you know, from becoming a, 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 a robotic engineer, from becoming a programmer, from becoming, you know, artificial intelligence scientists and all of those things. They are not rocket science. So, but because we are just not very intentional about all of those things. So, for me, I was very intentional and deliberate that we have to incorporate all of these things together. So, these were the five pillars of trust of what education should be. From an early age, these children are introduced to critical thinking and strategy planning. Unlike traditional approaches, critical thinking is not something you teach by theory. It comes through practical learning. And that's why in Heritage, chess is mandatory for all students because it has countless benefits. So you know that when they are playing, the student or the player is not thinking about the steps that he needs to make a load. He's also considering what will be the repercussion if he takes a step, what will be the step the opponent will use to counter that. So that is a forward thinking. Sure you understand. And these are things that in the first instance it will excite the children. And in the second instance they are actually learning. Even though when they seem to be playing. But they are learning and we are growing certain you know, skills and core you know, knowledge areas in them. So from the word ifrod, Al-Hajjul Qiran, Mr. Man. Together. Together. Uh, so in the period of, between Hajj and Umrah, the people is not allowed to engage in the word. So at One thing about heritage that I find most appealing is how central Islam is to everything. The day begins with Quran and ends with Islamic classes. And in between, we have secular education. As important as the secular education is, so is the same with Islamic education. And one of the reasons why this is so important is that we don't want our children to grow up not knowing, you know, the true understanding of their religion. And we do not want them to fall into the wrong hands of those who will have miseducated them or give them, you know, perverted knowledge of Islam and the like. The society is already stereotyped into quite a number of negative things about Islam and co. But are all of these things true? So we hold the responsibility of giving them the pristine knowledge of Islam, giving them the true knowledge of Islam. So this is why this is important, so that they grow up with proper knowledge, with pristine knowledge of Islam as revealed in the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, not according to any group or organization or sect or probably Imam at all. Then eventually I was chosen as the captain of the team. This is Faisal. He got selected to play football at an international level. And he came to Heritage to give his fellow students some motivation. Alhamdulillah, I'm actually doing well. And I hope I could just make Nigeria proud. And that's what I'm doing right now. Because I'm, I'm actually going out of the country to represent Africa. So the bottom line is that there is no success that is built inside a comfort zone. I am very thrilled that even in football, that Pfizer can come here and tell us that some are lazy. So, and those that are lazy, what happens to them? Do they get selected? No. They are not. So the same in academics. So the same with whatever experience that we are passing through here. There is no food for lazy man. You have to do the hard things for you to succeed. You are wearing shirts today. Do you know how many attempts and the efforts of people that woven eat? If you see what it takes the farmer to grow food, you possibly would have said that you will never eat for the rest of your life again. That if this is the difficulty that I will have to go through to get a corn produced, to, go, to get a yam produced, this is the reality of life. This is the reality of life. There is no place for any lazy man.
what did it take to set up Heritage, like the school itself, this building? How did you set it up? The school itself, like I explained earlier on, grew organically because it wasn't a school that I intended to set up. So I said it earlier on that uh, it was because, okay, some friends, so who, even initially, they were critics of the idea of myself homeschooling my children, who thought that I probably wanted to destroy the life of my children by keeping them at home, not allowing them to mix with other children in, you know, in the school environment so that they can gain social skills and all of those. So there were quite a number of criticisms and the like, but I never gave up because I knew what I was pursuing. So, and it was when one of them thereafter came and said, I think I've seen the result of the madness that you are actually doing. So please, you extend your madness to my own kid. So and that was how he dropped his own care, you know, daughter. Then. So they brought him to your home? Yes, to, to my home. It's just a home. It's, this was even just the home then. So, and at that time, little did I even realize that this was to be the beginning of something that I never, you know, even thought of at all. So because after dropping the first child with me, just the normal thing that, okay, your friend's child wants to be staying with you and be learning the same way that your own children are learning and the like. And after some months, it's the same person that actually brought two or three of his own friends again that they have been convinced enough because of what they have seen in the short space of time with that daughter that was dropped with me that they wanted to also drop their home. Mm -hmm. And so that was how they brought theirs as well. There were three of them. So they became four with mine. And we, so we continued that way. And still, all of this period, the idea of actually converting it to a school was not with me. I wasn't even thinking of that. Not until 2013, when I got the biggest boost that I never thought of in life. And um, I think in 2013, I had quite a number, uh, almost about um, 30 students that were brought for me. This was huge for me, that this is a bigger manner that I couldn't have, you know, given to somebody else to be handling for me. And so that, that was what forced me into even resigning my own employment then and be able to concentrate and focus so on what, this children. What were, you, what were you doing before? Yeah, the last employment, um, uh, the, the last employment area that I had was in telecommunication. Mm -hmm. I was in telecommunication, but quite earlier before the telecommunication, I was in the oil and gas industry mm -hmm. in the country. Mm -hmm. So. This was how the whole thing started transforming and transmitting into something that I never, you know, thought of. So it organically grew. There was never any time that I was probably in need of any fund to say I need to set up a school. There was never any time. We were growing gradually, you know, from the initial, uh, you know, idea of my own children alone to one child joining us. That doesn't make any difference to when they became four, to when they became seven, eleven, twenty-five, and thirty-five, and all of those ones. And now, how much do you have? So it's usually about it's floating around ninety-five to one hundred, wow. which is the maximum capacity of the facility that uh, we have. Mm -hmm. So uh, this whole thing, it was the idea was to to, to to teach your own children. Yes. And from that, you know, the other people started bringing in their children. Yeah. Now, in Heritage here, who are like the majority of the children? Where are they from? Are they from Nigeria here? Or, you know, how? Yeah. Almost 100% of the children are Nigerians. However, almost about 30% of them are children of Nigerians in the diaspora community. Mm -hmm. So you find a good number of them from USA, from Canada, from uh, Ireland, from UK, from Egypt, from Saudi Arabia, and some other countries across the world. So we are Nigerians, you know, especially Nigerian professionals. How, how much does it cost to, 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 to educate a child in heritage for the whole year? Because we are doing the unconventional thing, we are doing the unusual thing here. Yes, there is a school fees that is attached, but the school fees is kept at a very low form because we had some parents who, uh, who fell in love with what is going on in heritage and uh, who felt more Muslims should be able to benefit this. And so, in a way, uh, I would say that they bankroll quite a number of uh, funds requirement mm. so that we can keep the funds low and it can, you know, open the door to so many other people to come. Because currently what we still charge floats around um, are about $2,000, $2,005 
per year. Mm -hmm. So, but what we are actually spending, what it costs a child to actually be here, should be close to about five thousand mm dollars. -hmm. So, but because of the support, the huge support that I was actually getting from some well-spirited uh, parents, so they cover quite a number of those costs, and that's why the fee is kept that low. All right. Yeah. So is there any challenges you face setting this thing up and running it and how it is today? What are the challenges that you face? Yeah. I think um, the biggest challenge that I have is not something new in Nigerian environment generally. And that is about human capacity. You know, getting the right kind of people that um, will support you to run the dream itself. So I mean in terms of teachers generally, you know, um, this syndrome of uh, migration of a, a whole lot of Nigerians and I mean when people are migrating, the highest number of people that will migrate are people with substance, not some people without anything in their head. So quite a number of teachers are not available, good teachers are not available. They are not easy to come by. So this is the biggest challenge that we have. So getting, you know, good teachers, you know, trainable teachers and uh, those who are well passionate and committed to their work. I think for me, that is the biggest challenge for me in, in, in running the school. Emilia Abdullah is one of my all time best students. Very, you know, diligent, intelligent, brilliant, smart, sharp. She has memorized about 24 Jews of the Quran. Oh, wow. uh, yeah. One of my most notable achievements in heritage was when I got selected for the 2022 FGC challenge, which was a robotics challenge that was held in Switzerland. We were able to hold our heads up and shine and show ourselves that we were from heritage. Alhamdulillah, we came like we got the bronze medal for the International Unity Award. And it's, a, it's something I like I really hold on to, to today because it's a very it's a really major achievement for me. And then it gave me the confidence to believe that I can do anything once I set my mind onto it. Also, something that is good about heritage is that it's very diverse. You don't just focus on academics alone, you know. You have to focus on life skills, responsibility, care about others, not only about yourself. You need to know the Quran, you need to know the religion, you need to know different things. Like, you need to be versatile on different things. Yeah, sometimes I will just come suddenly and ask us questions, like random questions, international questions we have never heard before, and then he will educate us a lot. Sometimes he will reprimand us too, so we could, like, push harder and push boundaries and learn so much. In addition to the disruptive learning experience within the classrooms, some of these students are given the chance to expand their horizon beyond borders. So we have always been part of the World Robotics Olympiad it's in Russia, in Qatar, Costa Rica, in different cities of the US. We are part of um, participants of uh, African Leadership Academy Global Scholars Program almost every year since about 2014 till date. The future plan for Heritage is that we hope that, inshallah, we could write a lie. Um, we are probably spending our last um, you know, academic session in this uh, space. You know, like I said, we have been constrained every year in the last, almost in the last five, six, seven years. Um, we have barely been taking up to 50% of those who apply. And that is even despite the fact that we don't advertise, we don't market, we don't put any inscription anywhere. Yeah, if you pass by so here, you will not you think it's see anything. There's no so it's deliberate there. because we use it as a strategy to actually, you know, keep off the numbers. So, because when people rushed in, where do we want to keep them? So, my dream, my vision in the, in the next uh, one year is that we are transiting to a very bigger facility in a far bigger you know, environment and um, well serene environment and highly you know, value uh, uh, location, locality or neighborhood you know, in Lagos, in the mainland. Mm -hmm. So, that's where we hope that, inshallah, we are transiting to. Mm -hmm. So, and when we get there, that is when we actually can blossom and actually be able to implement most of the other programs and activities that this space is actually constraining us to be able to do. But when we have this space, that is when people can see a new perspective to education. That these children, even at secondary level, before they will be finishing, they are already made with skills that is sufficient for them to be able to live their life. So, that is the kind of dream that I have for education. And once we are able to do this successfully, uh, we do not want to pride ourselves to saying that it has to reside with us alone. We'll be ready to partner with you know, other 
uh, uh, organizations, other schools, other countries, and co to be able to extend this, you know, um, uh, 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 curriculum that we are running in heritage or the style of education that we are running, we need to multiply it. Camera, what's this? Camera? Which kind of camera is here? Is there any one of you who memorized the Quran? Yes. yes, all. But who has memorized the Quran? As we get to the final segment of our video, I just want to say a big thank you to each and every one of you for watching and engaging with my videos. We just hit 60,000 subscribers and I am truly humbled by the growing community. For those who have not yet subscribed, I invite you to join the community and share this video with a friend or loved one who may find inspiration in it. My final question to Mr. Lukman, what steps do we have to take as a continent to ensure that our children receive the best education and in turn contribute significantly to the advancement of the continent. What we actually need is homegrown curriculum. We can sit down, develop what is actually fit and suitable to for us. our own continent. Mm -hmm. We know our own challenges, we know our problems, we know our resources, we know what God endowment, what God has blessed us with and all of those things. And uh, we know the capacity of the human resources that we have. We are, we are not in doubt of any of these things. We are not lacking any of this. The unfortunate thing is that perhaps the way that our brain has been wired by the Western world is actually the limiting factor you know, for, for us today, thinking that we can actually not do anything without them. Whereas all the countries of the world that had actually grown and developed, they did homegrown education. They never followed anything. Singapore is a critical example that we use a whole lot. Which country's education system does Finland follow today? Their own system. Which country's education system does China follow today? In fact, some of these countries even have to be teaching, even using their own local languages. Great. So nothing says that we cannot teach physics, chemistry, biology in our own various languages. And when we talk about all of these subjects and co, we also you know, erroneously believe that all these things were developed by the Western world. No, it is not true. In fact, if there is anything at all, majority of them were from the Islamic world and uh, you know, African countries. The role that um, Muslims play in the development of science and technology is you know, out there for anybody that cares to actually verify the truth mm -hmm. and get into know. So my own advice is that we need to come back home. We need to sit back and look at our own challenges and how do we provide solution you know, to our own problems. So homegrown curriculum, homegrown education, it's one of the things that I think we need to sit back on. Because you actually find Africans in most of these other countries behind most of even the so-called you know, uh, breakthroughs that they are having in different fields of human endeavors. So you find a lot of Africans behind it. Philip Emiawali is one of the fathers of technology who developed you know, one of the fastest mega computers and the like. So it's not a, an American or a British or a French or a German, it's an African man. But why are they not doing it in Africa? And so that that is why we say that we need to even believe in ourselves. One of the philosophies that we teach the students in this school is that the first rule of success is knowing thyself. As much as I take these children to travel abroad to go and see things elsewhere, I also don't fail to let them know, you know, the beauty of our own nation, what God has blessed us with. So I remember one of those years that we traveled to uh, Costa Rica and they said, oh, there is nobody that comes to Costa Rica that, does, that doesn't visit a certain park. That's so we need to go there. And they charged, in fact, the students were charged $120 to go into such a park. And I, as a teacher, was charged about $150 or something more. So I was expecting so much that ah, for them to have charged this so much, then there must be something too superfluous that we have never seen that we'll find in, inside such a park. But behold, I was totally disappointed when we got mm -hmm. there because there was nothing inside this forest other than two major things. And it was so important to them that that is actually what they are selling. That they gave us, um, um, what do we call it, binoculars to be looking at um, spiders and butterflies. <laughs> and I said, is this what they charged me for? Something that is so ubiquitous, so common everywhere in Africa, in my country, that do you need to pay money to see any type of butterfly here? Mm. Do you need to pay money to see any spider anywhere here? Mm. We have even far, much more than all of this, and we do not value it. Mm. So, because we didn't realize how much we are blessed ourselves, 
So the first rule of success is to know ourselves. But in order to know yourself, I think yeah. you have to go around to see. And that is why I feel like it's very important what you're doing, taking these kids around to travel, to see other cultures, how other people are, are doing things. Of course, traveling itself, even Islamically, is, as he said, that it is education. Allah himself said in the Quran that travel over the land and see mm. what Allah has created, what mm. the beauty of what Allah has done. Mm. So what a better education is that? Mm. So traveling is education because it gives us a lot of opportunity to see newer things and newer perspectives. And you probably, you will be able to even appreciate the one that you have as well in your own area because you now have the opportunity to compare and contrast. Mm -hmm. So, you know, sometimes when we sit down inside our own cocoon, we believe that this is the best and the biggest thing to have happened in the whole world. Mm -hmm. But when you move over land, you actually see that what you are doing is just a tip. So that probably could assist you, could challenge you, to grow you better, to grow you more and strengthen you and the like. So that's why education itself, I mean, traveling itself is education and we need to cultivate this or infuse this as part of education for our children. Mm -hmm. In fact, we should do a lot of, um, you know, exchange programs, you know, with different countries, different schools and the like. It's actually we give a whole lot of, um, you know, learnings and teachings and exposure to our children, experiential right. learning for that matter. Any last words, any final? Yeah, yeah, maybe my final word is that whatever that um, one is doing, just do it well, do it excellently. And you must be very innovative about it. Don't do it the usual way that everybody is doing it. Because if you do it that way, you get the same result that has not led us anywhere. So for us to have a different result, you have to take a different approach. And when you take a different approach, do it excellently. And we always say something here. Integrity is doing the right thing at the right time, at the right place, even when no one is watching you. Mm. So this is our philosophy here. And this is what I want every one of us to also take away you know, in our work. So do it well, do it right, do it at the right place, even when no one is watching you. Excellently do it, be innovative, be creative in whatever that you are doing. And I think when we start doing it this way, we'll start getting so many things right.